This is always one of the highlights of um, my year because although I travel extensively and I see rice in areas where everybody seems to know how to grow it and they're committed to their particular types of rice, this is a community that's more open to new ideas than almost any rice community I know. So I think we have an opportunity to just engage in the kind of experimentation and learning process that's very exciting and is going to be required more and more for groups that want to keep up with both climate change and I would say the challenges but also the opportunities that that brings to us. There are going to be a lot of different pressures on the agricultural community but I think that also opens up new opportunities for people who are really alert and watching and thinking about how they can exchange information. Okay, so the Akogis have become have become good friends of ours and we look forward to coming and we also look forward to having them visit us at Cornell uh, at least once a year and I'm hoping that we can extend that conversation because one of the things we're trying to do is have taste tests for some of the rice that many of you are able to grow. So um, we'll be talking a little bit later this afternoon about how we might want to organize a li slightly larger ta taste test in the future. We're looking into um, what makes rice grown in this part of the world special. Okay. So, thanks to NSF for funding it. So we bring a little bit of funding to this process through a grant that I have from NSF on rice diversity. I'll tell you a bit more about it. I really enjoy working with Mia and this year she's had a major event in her life. She has had her first baby and that's um, another breeding project, let's say. <laughs> so um, I, <laughs> I met him for the first time. That's her F1, so we we're happy to have him. <laughs> So thanks to all of you for coming. So we have a, a rice diver we call it the Rice Diversity Project, and you can go online. I'll show you at the end if you want to learn more about what we're doing. Um, we have three objectives. This is part of the NSF-funded activity in my lab. One is to better characterize and utilize what we call natural genetic variation, meaning things that are found in land races or cultivars or wild species um, that we have to breed into rice to the cultivated forms of rice. Um, to enhance the adaptation to different ecological niches, this is one of those niches. Um, and you'll hear more from Sandy later about some breeding that's going on specifically for this niche. Um, and different rice production systems. So the organic rice production system is not a single thing. The SRI system is not a single thing. And of course what we call traditional agriculture is not a, tr is not a single thing. So we're just mixing and matching, experimenting with what, what works and to promote awareness of the diversity at the cultural, biological, and the culinary traditions that go along with rice. That's what, part of what makes working in agriculture so exciting, I think, is that you get to eat the product of your labor. So. so one question is how have humans shaped the diversity of rice? So this is one way in which the breeding community thinks about uh, the process of plant breeding. You start with natural variation in the form of a wild species and humans select on it. They select based on their own preferences, what they like, what they find acceptable, or just what grows. And it's no different than the process of natural selection at the genetic level. So artificial selection, which is you just choose what's going to provide you with seed for the next generation, is the simplest form of plant breeding. You impose selection. The next layer, if you will, is that you design the crosses that you make. And in nature, that's what happens to be next door rather than bringing something in on purpose to try to bring about a new combination genetically. But in our lab we do make both controlled crosses and we look at the variation at many levels. So humans have adapted different varieties to different environments. Rice is naturally aquatic and it's the only major crop plant in the world that can grow in standing water. And therefore we're trying to bring rice into ecosystems that are naturally wet in this part of the world. We're not trying to bring water to dry land, we're trying to bring rice to wet, low-lying domains of your farms or your fields where you often can't grow anything else. In many parts of the world it's flooded um, continuously as here and those rice plants that do well in those <coughs> systems have different root structures, and different developmental patterns and the microbial population in a flooded soil chemically and microbially is very different than in a dry soil or in an aer aerated soil. You'll probably hear more about wetting and drying systems where you go back and forth between these two. So this is the traditional flooded paddy system. 
produces about, I think it's about 80% of the world's rice right now, represents less than half of the rice area. So there's a lot more area that's not permanently flooded, but, it, but yields are lower, so it produces less overall of the world's rice. The upland varieties, this is an extreme case of upland varieties, like in the Cerrados of Brazil, where you see rice that's planted and in many cases it's planted in Brazil, they plant rice and they don't weed and they don't fertilize and they don't apply water and they do nothing except come back at the end of the season and harvest it. It's what we call low input and it has converted vast acreages in Brazil into rice producing regions. So that's dry land rice and it's produced on dry land in parts of Africa where you have a lot of acid soils, you have many other constraints. But I just want you to realize that it's not always grown in flooded paddies. Here's an extreme case. I, I think it's a little hard to see if I have a pointer. But this person is, uh, this is a breeder. The water level is here. This is what we call deep water rice. And there are vast parts of Thailand. I don't know if you followed the floods in Thailand last year. About three quarters of the country was flooded. I mean flooded. And Typically, in an average year, about 30% of Thailand floods, and they have developed these deep water rices, which elongate. So they put them in either before the floods, and they grow with the rising water, and people go out in boats and harvest the crop off of the floating, their floating rices in a sense. They can elongate 10 inches a day, and they only elongate when the water is moving up. So they have a genetic capacity to interpret the difference between a flash flood and constantly rising water and they only grow if it's constantly rising. The problem with these rices is that once they grow they can't shrink so if the water level falls you know they will fall over. But normally since this is a habitual thing in that region of Thailand it floods and it stays flooded and you go out and you harvest in boats. Some people um, actually put the seed in a, in a sort of clutch of, uh, of mud and drop it and that's how they plant it so that it'll sink. So there are different ways of dealing with rice and water. Water's hydrology is one of the major issues about what rice you plant and I would say that what's very exciting to those of us who work in also how these systems work, uh, some of the genetics are now known, some of the genes were cloned about a year and a half ago that allow the plant to understand what it is that turns on the pathway that tells it to rise. So it's a hormonally regulated system. And it basically is just the same system that tells the plant to grow normally, except it's an external rather than an internal signal in that case. OK. Sorry. And then we have varieties adapted to high altitudes. This happens to be a picture from the Philippines. Um, but in China, India, Philippines, and of course all over the Andes Mountains, you have terraced hillsides. And terraced hillsides are a very classic way of extending your growing area. In the rice terraces in the Philippines, what's amazing about the system is that the rainwater is coming down, of course, and all of this water is managed so that one paddy never floods another. So this is a very elaborate irrigation scheme that gives people access to water in a very regulated way, and the rice is hand transplanted into these paddy systems and they have a number of very interesting problems in the paddies to maintain the paddies. The number one problem they have is earthworms. And the only reason I mention this to this group is because many people in organic agriculture think earthworms are just inherently good. But the earthworm that's found in the paddy system in this part of Banawe in the Philippines is about a foot long. Oh it's about this wide and it drills through the paddy and makes holes in the dikes and the water floods out and then the dikes are destroyed. This was an introduced pest and it's just become endemic, it's very, very problematic and nobody has any way to deal with it other than management. So I just mentioned things that are just interesting about different environments and things we sometimes take for granted. Okay, so here we are. Um, this was from last year, Ogie's Farm. Temperate varieties, these are uh, most of the varieties that seem to do really well here, many of them are coming from Hokkaido, Japan. So we have a, a very equivalent zone of adaptation. Um, they can be grown here in Vermont, in New York, and in other places in the temperate 
zone, and it turns out you can talk to Ogi and other of the people who've tried different varieties. California, which grows temperate rice, those varieties are not as well adapted to this zone. Um, they just don't flower, they're not as early, et cetera. So there's a, a lot of interesting things about adaptation. We also see that there are unique flavors, textures, aromas that people really want in the rices they grow. Sometimes they know a priori what they want, and sometimes they come back on it afterward and say, I really like that rice. Um, I don't know why, but I really like that rice. So we're working on that both forward and backwards in that, to that extent. I show this slide last year, and I really want to just say that we work a lot with variation at the DNA level. We're looking at what makes one rice different than another. Doesn't mean we do transgenics. It means we look at the DNA that makes any one of us different than anything else. And why certain things grow well in one environment. Um, each rice, each rice variety, it shouldn't have said culture, should have said variety, has its own unique DNA pattern. And its DNA pattern is the song that gives it its own identity. So there's something that many people have about um, working at the DNA level that makes them start to feel queasy. Um, our lab works a lot at the DNA level. And this is actually, uh, just to show you, these are the DNA fingerprints. Each lane in this gel is a different rice variety. So these two have the same fingerprint at that locus. These share that one. This is a sample of Ariza glabarima, which is the domesticated form of rice cultivated in Africa, West Africa. And I just want to say that it's a very interesting thing because when I first went into a molecular biology lab and somebody put something like this on the screen and started talking about it, this is what I was thinking. I thought, oh, how interesting. Humans have this way of representing um, how we understand the world. So how do we understand the world? Well, we understand the world through things that are similar and we, and we document them in different ways. And this is basically a, allowing us to understand what is similar and what is different. And we correlate things that have the same genetic profile or at certain loci with how they behave. And that's part of how we understand how these things work. So just thought I'd, I'd put that slide up. We're also very interested in the rituals associated with rice and rice production. This is an offering. Um, this particular statue was taken in Bali, Indonesia. And um, every day at sunrise and at sunset, they make offerings to this god for, for their harvest. And they do this with a, in, a, in a manner of just sort of normal. There's no ceremony about it. It's just you leave your offering and you go work on your patty. And so these are the very traditional ways in which I think fertility rites um, gods of fertility, gods of the harvest, and offerings have all been integrated into different systems. And we all, we all in some way, I think, have inherited that respect. We just don't always practice it. But the respect for what makes one cycle give rise to the next. So I'm going to just end by saying, if you want to learn more about the project that we work on, and we're a fairly large lab. We're a lab of about 20 people, maybe. We have, we're training somewhere between. Um, six to 10 graduate students, PhD level students, and we have staff and visiting scientists, sabbaticals, anyway, people coming from all over the world. We work very closely with uh, the group in Stuttgart, Arkansas, which is our National Rice Research Center. Anna's representing them today, but she'll tell you more about that center. And that's the heart of rice production in the United States. 60% of US rice is grown in Arkansas, and we're able to grow out trials and do many things um, in a large scheme in that subtropical environment. We're also working quite closely here with this group just because we really enjoy it, we really like it, and the NSF seems to think this is something worth looking at because they like the experimental nature of it. They really like the idea that people are trying new things. So you guys are all on the radar screen. If you go into our rice diversity site, just ricediversity.org, and you click on education and outreach, if you, there's a menu that will open up you can scroll down to Rice in the Northeast Project, and it'll open up a screen that looks like this. If you hadn't found it before, you can find it now. And then you can click on, this is this year's, uh, this year's conference. This was last year's, and there were some from previous years. And what's up there at the moment is if you click on last year's, you can come in and get the presentations. They're being videoed, and this gentleman behind you is, is videoing everything. So if you miss the conference or you want to share it with someone, 
you'll be able to go online and get streaming video of all of the presentations here today and then you have now the proceedings that have been written up which are transcriptions that Mia carefully documented what it is that we present and share. So she's going to try to document that today and I just tell you that because I think it's really important the role that you play is bigger than the number of people in this room. The way in which the voices will get out to the community is potentially quite great and you can catapult this as well. You can share this site with people. So um, I want to just say Erica who's in the back of the room spoke last year. She spoke about SRI. Uh, there's a beautiful um, presentation that Takeshi did last year which is really much more lovely on a screen in a dark room than it, it, it was shown in this room which you know the color wasn't quite as good. We had some really interesting talks last year about um, amphibians, dragonflies and some of the um, other creatures for whom a rice paddy is the ideal environment to, in which to live. So we're interested in the way in which the paddy gives us rice but also the paddy gives us many other things. Trying to be aware of that and to take pleasure in those things around us. So with that I think I'll end and say this was, um, this again is thank you to the group that comes together. All of you make these rice conferences exciting for us and I look forward to sharing with you over the course of the day. Thank you. Do you have lyrics for the song? <laughs> I wish I could sing. Yeah, <laughs> I could tell you which song that was, but I can't sing it, it for you. On the no, but there's an idea. Good idea. Good. That's that's the idea I needed for t for this morning. <laughs> yeah. What or has anything been done to sort of identify or to estimate the number of acres in the Northeast that are suitable for rice production? I would say that should be put on an agenda item because I don't think we've even attempted it. And it's an interesting question. It's really so much related to small, low-lying areas on different farms. That would be a wonderful way to go about it. I remember the very first year, um, Mia may want to comment on this, but we had the Commissioner of Agriculture from Vermont and several people from the Water Conservation Department here talking to us about management, land management in the state. And we were interested um, we are interested to work with all of you on the, on the state side to try to ensure that this whole thing is a way forward in an ecologically responsible way. So anything you can do to help us and to help people find out what they can do with low-lying spots on their farm. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Tatiana. Yeah, just to add to that, it would be interesting to see if, um, if rice could play a role in farming in terms of the amount of I guess one concept was that um, often wetlands are seen as an impediment to development in many m people's minds and one of the ideas was to blend the conservation of the wetlands with concepts of humans interacting productively with those wetlands. In some cases that would enable us to think about using those wetlands in a, in a rotation scheme with rice. It's a very interesting question and problem and it depends very much on each one but I, I do know that floods like that that you guys had there's no rice that would you know tolerate that but it's just more the management of the water and I think that's what you're thinking about the longer term. Well like um, last year after the flood everybody was talking about you know, what kind of crops the people grow in areas that are so flood prone, you may lose that year's crop, but you would have utilized the land in a way that um, keeps it from being developed in some other way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So maybe one more question and then we'll be on the end. I have a, a question about, um, in fact, growing rice in things that have already been designated as wetlands. I'm from New York State. Mm -hmm. and 
a farmer I know near me has quite a lot of land that's actually designated as official wetlands and he doesn't know if he's allowed to grow rice in it. And I didn't know if you know who one would ask, how one would you would out. You would ask whatever your state department of environmental so conservation yes, the state but, conservation. but okay. wetlands are not the, the most suitable, well you can't really grow rice in wetlands mm -hmm. first of all, and then it's not a very suitable environment for rice because you need to be able to control the water. And wetlands are kind of a colder, more groundwater flat, it's a colder soil. So it's not that suitable for rice. Rice needs as much warmth as it can in the northeast to mature within the yeah. northeast. So it wouldn't be a suitable environment and then the wetlands issue, we don't want to be destroying um, already. Well, that, I was worried about that and I also was thinking that you also don't get that benefit against weeds because you've already got a whole bunch of crops that are growing right. in that wet soil, in effect. Yeah. Which was what I told him at the time, but then I kept puzzling over, are people actually using that wet the, soil? The target is more like low-lying areas that are kind, you know, kind of wet, that have already wet. kind of been agricultural pasture land or uh -huh. cornfields, that kind of thing, but aren't seasonal, you know, full entire season wet, but you can bring in moisture through um, a reservoir or, uh, something like that, and then you can create a patty. It's yep. not a wetland to begin with, it's something you create. Okay. So it's like a week